All right, let's try this again. Hi, Gary. Hi, you got audio now? Yes. Ah, oh, the joys of, of live live streaming and the, right. the craziness that can happen. Oh, yes. well, I have an introduction for you. I'd love to read it. Okay, thank and you. And welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're so excited to have Gary Hines here today. Gary is from Sounds of Blackness, uh, which celebrating 50 years of blackness, jazz, blues, spirituals, rock and roll, R&B, gospel, hip hop, and soul. These are the sounds of blackness. They've performed for kings and queens, presidents and ambassadors at concert halls, corporations, schools, colleges, and festivals all over the world. The Sounds of Blackness appears, appearances include the Olympics, the World Cup, the Riders' Cup, the NFL, NBA, MLB, the Grammy Awards, the Denver Summit of Eight, NAACP National Convention, the Super Bowl. Sounds of Blackness has appeared with Quincy Jones, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jackson, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Kirk Flank, Franklin, Shirley, Shirley Caesar, Yolanda Adams, Sting, Prince, Elton John, Maya Angelou, Usher, Harry Belafonte, Allo Black, Common, Legend, John Legend, and many more. They've won Image, Soul Train, Stellar, International Time for Peace, and three Grammy Awards. Their life-changing top 10 single and video royalty now on iTunes was nominated for two NAACP Image and two Stellar Awards. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. I appreciate it, Joanna. I would just like to thank everyone for joining us here at the Minnesota Music Summit. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share some words and thoughts with you. Uh, for the next uh, half hour or so and, and question and answer to follow and perhaps in between as well. I am a native of Yonkers, New York, and the relevance of that to Minnesota music and its future is as follows. When I was asked to do this, one of the first things I said to Joanna was, um, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you are and you can't know where you are unless you know where you've been. And so a uh, historical perspective for me was important before we could have a, a real relevant conversation about the future of Minnesota music. And I have a unique perspective uh, on that coming from Yonkers uh, in the 60s uh, when it was a very different landscape. But the first thing you need to know, and, and some of you may not know, is the very thing that brought me here and uh, my, my siblings and, and uh, parents was the fact that Minneapolis St. Paul was a jazz mecca. Uh, many people, too many people don't know that. Um, so how did that bring us here? Well, my mother, the late great Doris Hines, in her own right was an internationally renowned jazz singer. She performed with people like Duke Ellington, Sarah Vaughan, um, my goodness, Dinah Washington, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, names that I know you, you know and are aware of. And what you need to know is that Duke Ellington, Count Basie were in and out of the Twin Cities at, all the time. Uh, places like the Prom Center and the Marigold Ballroom, uh, they would play and, and would play at the sold out shows, sometimes held over. And that held over reality and the Twin Cities love and hunger for jazz is what brought my mother here. She was booked for two weeks and was held over for almost a year. Uh, the top of the Sheraton called the Gollywog Lounge. Uh, there were plenty of, of other jazz clubs here in the Twin Cities that fell in love with her and she fell in love with them and relocated us here from Yonkers, New York to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And again, that was early mid 60s. The landscape at the time in Minnesota music was already very interesting. Too many people don't know that it, it's not really an anomaly that, that the Twin Cities or that Minnesota would produce both a Prince and a Bob Dylan uh, and the Sounds of Blackness. And the reason it's not an anomaly is because of, of the phenomenon that we experienced and that I experienced upon moving to the Twin Cities from uh, Yonkers, New York. And that scenario was this. 
particularly a very active music scene um, across cultural lines, but particularly uh, in the African-American community. Now, right in the midst as well of many polka bands and big band jazz, uh, band jazz players, um, blues players, and so forth, was a very vibrant R&B community, uh, blues, jazz, and gospel as well within the black community. There were groups uh, in the 60s and 70s that easily would have and could have rivaled the Motown groups as well, the Four Tops and the Temptations. There were groups that unfortunately some of you may have never heard of. Showtime, part one and two. Um, Philadelphia Story, the Midwest Express, and many, many more easily could have rivaled the Temps and the, the uh, Four Tops and the Miracles uh, all from Motown, right here in the Twin Cities. That's the first thing to know. So they came from a wellspring of, of culture. And, and it's such uh, a contradiction almost in terms of the reality of the setting. And that is, with such a small uh, African-American population, you would think such an explosive and dynamic and extensive music scene would be more uh, reminiscent of a Chicago, a Detroit, uh, a New York, a Los Angeles. But what happened was those uh, groups, those artists, uh, and in fact, the community itself, rather than to be just totally absorbed uh, into uh, the general culture, they really cleaved unto their own culture and really um, developed and nurtured it. And they did that in venues uh, that some of which you, again, may have never heard of, uh, African-American clubs, uh, the Nakarima, which is, is American, it's spelled backwards. Uh, the Blue Note, the Cozy Lounge, uh, all of those are historic places and should be designated as historic landmarks because the other reality was, uh, and here's where, where the, the dichotomy comes, despite the welcoming and the appreciation of the music, um, racism was alive and well uh, in the Twin Cities and, and overtly so. Many of those same groups, despite their excellence, were not able to play clubs um, that uh, were in the, the downtown area, that were in the suburban area. Um, and club owners, many of them would even have code words like it's getting too dark in here. If there was too much, Af too many African clientele or, or uh, uh, attending uh, a given event or a given night. And so they were always looking for places to play. And many times, uh, they only could play, of course, uh, in the black community at different black clubs and events. And not only was there a thriving R&B community, but blues as well. Um, the great cornbread Harris, who just celebrated, uh, I believe, his 95th birthday just a day or two ago. Um, Lazy Bill Lucas. Uh, the, the list goes on and on uh, with these artists and gospel as well. Groups you may not be familiar with or names you may not be familiar with. So before even a Sounds of Blackness or a Darnell Davis or um, a James Greer and company, well before, there were two groups with similar names that were, were national level uh, corrals, the Cantinos and the Cantorians. And many times people would confuse them because, of course, the names are, are fairly similar. The Cantinos and the Cantorians, they sang spirituals and gospels, put on uh, concerts, and, and again, were, were national and international level performers, even back in the 50s and 60s. So coming from New York, seeing all this, it was really a surprise because the first thing we noticed uh, coming from New York uh, is where's all the black folks? In fact, for that matter, um, where's all the dark hair? When we came to Minnesota uh, from Yonkers in the 60s, uh, primarily we saw uh, a lot of blonde Scandinavians and Germans, and, and that's wonderful. Everybody's beautiful. But coming from New York, we were used to, to dark hair. I mean, Italian, Irish, uh, Eastern European, um, uh, Jewish, and then, of course, uh, Jamaican, Cuban, uh, the original uh, multi-ethnicity uh, type of uh, situation that we now um, almost take for granted. Uh, but that was the case in New York. But coming to Minnesota in the 60s, that was not the case. We were no, no, uh, nowhere near as diverse uh, in terms of our um, population as we are now. And that, of course, also impacted the music and the culture. So 
with the R&B groups having to to find uh, venues on their own to play more often than not, occasionally they could play places like, like Mr. Lucky's on Lake Street. Um, I remember going to Mr. Lucky's um, and it, it was a great club at the time, live music, Michael's Mystics, so many. And there were uh, other groups at the time that were playing either rock and R&B, um, still roving. I mean, there's so many names that you may not know it and that you would hear sometimes on uh, KDWB. But what you might not know is that there was, a, of course, a sister station um, that was, of course, in the Black community well before KMOJ, KUXL, 1570 AM, an AM station. Uh, and don't laugh because at the, ta- at the time, actually, AM radio uh, was the dominant before uh, FM uh, was as we think of it now. We tend to uh, look down on AM now to, to some degree. Many people do, but that was not the case. AM uh, was dominant. But 1570, KUXL, Pharaoh Black, Thornton Jones uh, really was a voice of the community. So that was the backdrop, that dichotomy, the appreciation of Black music, of jazz, of gospel, of blues, of R&B, um, but still the reality of the situation in the everyday life was being redlined to and and uh, segregated uh, into to predominantly or exclusively uh, African American neighborhoods in North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, uh, and St. Paul, and that redlining and segregation uh, extended into the cultural realities of the music of where we could and could not play and go uh, uh, safely and, and with any uh, level of consistency. That's the backdrop that that produced uh, a prince who grew up in South Minneapolis. And uh, that's something else to clear up. Um, a lot of times people associate him, and I understand why, because so many of the rehearsals were at the, the house in North Minneapolis, and we all know the story. But Prince was a Southsider, just for the record. Uh, he grew up uh, in South Minneapolis and uh, attended Bryant Junior High School, where yours truly also attended. Uh, upon moving here from Yonkers, and uh, not at the same time. We were some years apart, but uh, he was at, at Bryan Junior High School and then later went on to Central High School, where yours truly also attended. And uh, I remember my senior year uh, hearing about this young guy down at Bryan Junior High School that was a beast on every instrument, and uh, guess who that was? So he did not uh, evolve uh, and emerge in a vacuum. He came from a wealth of music. Uh, you probably remember from the movie Purple Rain that that Prince's father was also a prolific musician and and composer and songwriter, and so that backdrop was there. Both he and I come from music professional parents uh, and being surrounded uh, by this music. Uh, Prince would and he would talk about it all the time, uh, and we would as as teenagers. Uh, we, of course, we couldn't get into the clubs, but we would go and stand out. Uh, outside and listen to the music at the Nakarima and the Cozy Bar and hear uh, Maurice McGinnis and the Blazers and the groups like the Amazers. I know you've never heard these names, but you need to know this perspective. And there's a reason why you never heard those names because uh, of the situation that that I alluded to er uh, earlier in terms of their deliberate uh, exclusion and suppression. But they survived and thrived despite that. But we would listen to them uh, outside and learn from them and, and that is the backdrop of a Jimmy Jam and a Terry Lewis and a Prince and a Sounds of Blackness. Nothing happens in a vacuum. It came from that reality, that cultural reality and that political reality as well. Well, fast forward to the 70s when uh, Prince Rogers Nelson is now emerging into his uh, international stardom and, and becoming uh, a worldwide artist and figure that, that's renowned and revered everywhere. Now the Twin Cities uh, is on the map uh, for something uh, in addition to Bob Dylan and the Vikings. And here's Prince Rogers Nelson, and he's doing this wide variety of music uh, in the vein of A Sounds of Blackness that's combining R&B and soul and, and strains of gospel and rock and pop and jazz, every sound of blackness. So we're, we're not the first to do that. Of course, he did his own take on that. And now... Instead of uh, the Twin Cities looking outward now, the, the, the eye, the, the purview, the perspective, the parallax view, if you will, is on the Twin Cities, uh, largely due to that notoriety of not only Bob Dylan, 
but Prince Rogers Nelson as well. And now you also have emerging uh, almost uh, just shortly after Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, uh, the Flight Time Band, which we now know as The Time, and the artists that emerged from that. Cynthia Johnson with Funky Town, uh, Alexander O'Neill. And so that, that very, very active uh, scene permeated the different arenas of the music uh, profession. So not only live shows, but recording studios as well. Recording studios were at a premium at the time. And uh, at the top of the list, it was Sound 80. You need to know that, that Sound 80 was, was a, a national caliber a studio here, Sounds of Blackness, were uh, honored to uh, record our first record there in 1974. And so many of the groups would re record at uh, Sound 80 um, and, you know, save it, but it wasn't cheap. You'd save up your money to do that, but you'd get the quality recording uh, that you needed. There were a few other studios as well, but Sound 80 was the top of the list and brought in international and national artists as well. So what you have by me mentioning in all this and, and giving you this backdrop is the emergence of Twin Cities as a music mecca that the world and the nation is now recognizing. So the backdrop for that already existed as we, we started out in the beginning telling you about all the different groups and, and the dynamic uh, um, situations that were going on in terms of their performances and so on, their recordings. But now it's not a best kept secret. Now the world, the country uh, is seeing it and now they are coming here. That's why Prince Rogers Nelson uh, built Paisley Park here in the Twin Cities. As you know, he loved Minnesota and, and the Twin Cities. Uh, and of course, Hollywood from day one was trying to get him to move to Los Angeles. And, you know, while he did have a, re a residence and facilities there, he would never leave the Twin Cities, told them he was not going to do so, and never did. They were going to come to Minneapolis to record. Same for Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. With their uh, national and international success, uh, with Human League and George Michael and on and on, Los Angeles was calling, insisting that they move to Los Angeles. They said, it's not going to happen. We're going to be right here. You guys are going to come to us. And so Janet Jackson and Michael Jackson and and George Michael and all the rest of them, uh, the hundreds of, of world renowned artists uh, that they worked with came here to the Twin Cities uh, and from that point went ahead and, and uh, their careers burgeoned and blossomed. I'm going to pause for just a second and switch to another device because I think this is starting to freeze up. Sounds good. And while you do that, I'll just jump in and say hello and welcome to everybody. And thank you for being here today. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the schedule, um, please do so. Uh, there are a lot of workshops and uh, panels and things today. Gary, just give me a heads up whenever you feel ready to continue again. And um, tonight we're really excited to have a live from Fairmont Opera House uh, with Anat Spiegel, Dread I Dread, and uh, Milo performing. Um, there are tickets available if you'd like to come join us in person here in Fairmont, or uh, we can uh, you can also watch on the live stream, uh, and the link is on mnmusicsummit.org. Hello, you ready? Hello. <laughs> Welcome Hi. back. I am back. Sorry about that. No worries. It sounds okay. great. All right, good. Glad to hear that. So, as I was mentioning, now the eyes of the world are on the Twin Cities. Uh, that was not the case in the 60s. Uh, and now in the 70s, that is the case and has been the case and continues to be the case musically. This small metro area with such a wealth of music and beyond uh, African-American music, of course, there's the Minnesota Orchestra, uh, the St. Paul Chamber or Orchestra. There's so many different uh, genres that the country and the world are seeing and marveling at and bringing attention to this area. 
So now that we've laid that backdrop historically and, and talked about, uh, to a degree, the present landscape, it's time to talk about how all of that is re relevant and related to um, going into the future with Minnesota music. And I would propose that this is the case. Given that background and that's been established, so well established and what we're known for and, and what is here and, and has been established for current artists, it's time to do two things, to reinforce, reinforce that legacy and to expand upon it. So how do we do that? Well, reinforcement and expansion, I believe, can happen in two ways in terms of moving forward uh, with the future of Minnesota music. Reinforcement and expansion can happen through institutions, uh, my fellow artists and, and followers. Now, what do I mean by that? One of the things uh, that, that Prince uh, really implored me and Sounds of Blackness to do, um, one of many things, was to be involved, directly involved in academic institutions, in the schools and colleges, uh, in the community, and to let people know that this music was alive and well, and that it was something that's not just for a stage, but not just art for art's sake, but art for life's sake. And so the first thing I would uh, recommend for moving into the future with your, with our music here in Minnesota, is to contact and interact and align yourself with schools and colleges. There are so many here at all levels, actually, um, and because Right now, many of the schools, especially the public schools, too many of them don't even have music programs or they're insufficient uh, and they need us. They need that in, that uh, our presence to reinforce and, and to reestablish uh, the music presence. Let me let me just say something to to um, bring home the importance of that. Prince Rogers Nelson. Jimmy Jam Harris and Terry Lewis and Gary Hines all went to Minneapolis public schools, all came up through, were nurtured, taught, uh, and, and developed in Minneapolis public schools and their music programs. So even uh, at, at Minneapolis Central High School, inner city school, as they would label us, we had jazz band, orchestra, concert band, march band, and pep band. There were two or three choruses, some of which uh, won state uh, choral competitions. So we come from Jam, Lewis, Prince, Gary, all come, Cynthia Johnson, all come from, we are products of the public school system. And the, the tools that it helped nurture and develop us in too many instances are no longer there or are not there to the same degree. That's gonna have a detrimental and a deleterious effect on students uh, who are in music or potential students who who may not even have the opportunity to do that. Uh, a few years ago, I was at uh, Henry High School uh, in North Minneapolis doing a, a, a professions and, and career type of workshop. And one of the things I was able to do was to listen to some of the singers uh, that, that were at students at the school and just amazing talent. And uh, at the end of their, their presentations, I asked, you know, are you are you in the choir? Are you in the band? And their answer broke my heart. We don't have a choir. We don't have a, it's like, what? That's insane. And so we as Minnesota artists, really, we owe it to them to, to offer our services uh, to the school system, to be a part of that, and, and to help to nurture and, and to rear and develop uh, that untapped talent. The same way we are beneficiaries of those who nurtured us within the school system, public school system. Um, so there's no hesitation. There's no, I, I'm sure you'll be welcomed, uh, but all you have to do is to make that step to offer what? Offer master classes, seminars, workshops, lecture demonstrations uh, at, at any duration. It can be something that's short term, midterm, or long term. Uh, and they can work out. Uh, finances and 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 uh, um, honorariums and all of that with you, but the main thing is that it happens and that it happens on a continuous and on a broad scale. And, and middle school, 
high school and the area colleges and universities. You know that we have several of them. Uh, my alma mater, where Sounds of Blackness were born, uh, McAllister College, again, perfect example. We were born out of McAllister College, um, again, my alma mater, in, in 1971. And I'm going to just digress a moment to tell you about that, just, just to drive home this point of being involved with the institutions of, of, of education and of higher learning. In 1969, uh, McAllister College embarked on a very ambitious program uh, to recruit students of color called EEO, and that stood for Expanded Educational Opportunities. And they were very successful with that. Uh, at one point on a campus of about 2,000, uh, they had almost 200 students of color, primarily African-American, but all different ethnicities. Well, one of the offshoots of that was that the students themselves um, founded a number of different activities and organizations. There was a political group called BLAC, the Black Liberation Affairs Committee. Uh, there was a, a theater group and dance group called Black Arts Midwest. And there was this 50 voice choir called the McAllister College Black Voices uh, under the direction of our emeritus founder, Mr. Russell Knight, the native of Beaumont, Texas. Well, fast forward uh, to 1971, yours truly's uh, sophomore year at McAllister, and Russell asked me on as director, and I was very honored because they were even excellent back then. But the vision uh, God gave me with this excellent ensemble was to follow the tradition of Duke Ellington, who we talked about later. That's why I wanted to give you that, earlier, excuse me, that's why I wanted to give you that uh, historic perspective. We hear Duke's name and we think of jazz, and we should, but too many people don't know that Duke Ellington wrote, recorded, and performed spirituals, gospel, blues, uh, and all the different sounds of blackness. So we can't claim credit for that template. And so that's the origin and meaning of the name Sounds of Blackness. But the point, my friends, is we came out of McAllister College, again, institution of higher learning, and different groups. Uh, such as I mentioned earlier, Showtime Part 1 and 2, they uh, at the time uh, came out, they came out of Minneapolis Central High School, uh, most of that band. And there are countless instances of that. That can't happen unless there are music programs in place and or seasoned uh, and people, artists, true artists uh, like Prince Rogers Nelson that would go into the schools that would help them that would make themselves accessible and even part of the curriculum to whatever the degree that the school will allow. So that's the one piece in terms of, again, we talked about reinforcing and going into the future, uh, reinforcing the legacy. The other in terms of beyond um, institutions of higher learning and education, this may surprise you. Libraries are the most underutilized resource in the community. Why in the world uh, am I talking about Minnesota music and libraries? Well, first of all, it's about documentation and history and documenting all of uh, your music and, and activities in a, a formal institution. But beyond that, too many uh, of us artists don't know that many of the, the names that I mentioned earlier, whether it's Cornbread Harris or Doris Hines, the library system featured for about a five-year period. They called it the Minnesota Legends of Jazz. And they would come to, to the libraries, uh, right in the buildings themselves, and do live performances that they were well paid for. But the main beneficiaries were all people of Minnesotans of all backgrounds. Uh, red, brown, yellow, black, white, young, old, men, women, you name it, would come to those concerts and learn because there was not only a live performance, but there was question answer or lecture demonstration. The, the library system has already also done this, not only with jazz, they've done, I know with, with uh, classical music, uh, they've done a blues series. And so there is room for everyone. And again, the main beneficiaries are not only the attendees who learn uh, more than they ever would have at first hand from you, the artists, but that benefits, that be, those benefits are reciprocal you will benefit and learn from them as well and from doing that. It's a different take on just a, a club gig or a, con a regular concert uh, because there's that interaction and exchange of a lecture demonstration, uh, of a, a seminar, of a master class that doesn't happen when you're on stage uh, at the club or at the concert. So I would encourage you again, 
institutions of learning, the academic institutions, the libraries as well. And there's another in terms of institution. Minnesota has probably the best park system in the country. The Minneapolis Park Board uh, is one example. They uh, have had a series of uh, performance uh, that have gone on in summers past that, that can be re revived now if we as artists uh, make ourselves available to do that. Uh, they had uh, something called the art art that would go around to different parts. It, would, it was this big truck that would open up to a stage and you would perform right there uh, on, the, on the spot before uh, in the neighborhoods, in the parks, you know, for the children, young, old, all of that would, would come to the art art in the parks and benefit. It's another gig. Again, it's a paid gig. It's income. I know it's all about income. We got to survive out here. Believe me, I know. But also, we're going to derive the benefits of sharing the music and, and the cultural experience uh, with that audience in ways that are different from your conventional gigs. I can't say that enough. This type of activity, in terms of a direction for the future of Minnesota music, connecting with schools, connecting with libraries, connecting with the park system, really grassroots is what it's all about. In the African-American tradition, which goes back actually to our African roots, uh, roots, as I said earlier, music is not just about art for art's sake, it's art for life's sake. Uh, in the African tradition uh, that, that we sustained even throughout centuries of, of, of slavery and oppression uh, in, in one form or another, the music uh, was and is still a survival mechanism, uh, an encouragement, a sustainer. And that's the case, I believe, in all cultures to different degrees and in different ways. But the same reality happens. And it happens through you, the artists. We know that we're in, uh, and this will be uh, my last piece of that before we see if we have any questions. I know we've covered a, a lot of ter territory. The other component uh, is... Uh, in terms of taking Minnesota music into the future, is that, as it said, uh, we live in a digital world, okay? Um, the medium uh, is the message and the massage. Uh, a great uh, author, Marshall McLuhan, uh, wrote a book called The Medium is the Massage, and he meant that the very medium itself actually impacts how we learn and how we uh, behave with it. And so now in the digital age, uh, my fellow artists and, and, and followers, listeners here, the digital reality of virtual performances now in this time, especially uh, of, of COVID protocols and so forth, uh, is something that does not have to be a detriment, uh, but actually can be a positive. And so I would set forth these uh, particulars for you uh, as we talk about uh, as really moving forward uh, in the future with Minnesota music in Minnesota. I would strongly urge you to pre-record, uh, videotape, whatever phrase you want to use, film your performances, your rehearsals, and, and your songs uh, individually and in concert form to have them available for use not only online, uh, on the internet, but also for schools and colleges, uh, for churches, libraries, for community centers uh, is, the, is the other component as well uh, that I hadn't mentioned earlier uh, to connect with and, and really relate on a grassroots level our music to the community as we move forward in the future. But the digital option is really important because, because many times, even if it's not a COVID restriction situation, and of course now currently it still is, um, to have the option of a virtual performance uh, of a song of yours, uh, of the national anthem, of whatever it is, um, really will serve you well in a number of ways. Number one, uh, to provide, to fulfill the need of whatever client that you're sending the music to, but also it's gonna archive your music. And so uh, archive sounds like a historical term for past, but archive uh, is actually for future reference so that people can access it, your performances over and over again, and you can actually monetize that, you know, on your website. Uh, and I'm presuming that that it's a foregone conclusion that you have a website uh, as artists uh, moving into the future in Minnesota with our music. 
a website is uh, essential, okay, not optional. But you can monetize that by having those performances available on your website, doing uh, live performances on your website, again, use, utilizing the digital age as we go forward. And not only is your audience, when you do that, uh, local or national, it's immediately, instantaneously international. Um, you're not talking about spending tens of thousands of dollars to fly to Europe or Asia or South America, uh, especially in a pandemic when we can't really safely do that yet. So the minute you do that and post it online, know that the whole world now is uh, benefiting from and experiencing Minnesota music as it goes forth into the future. Really in this uh, past several minutes, it's been really the tip of the iceberg uh, for me to talk about um, some of Minnesota's uh, music past, just to set a backdrop to talk about the present and as we move into the future. But hopefully uh, we've covered enough ground where we've given you specifics that you can deal with as opposed to just giving you lofty ideas uh, and that you know exactly what you can do, steps you can take to solidify, as we said earlier, and reinforce Minnesota music as we venture forth into the future. So I'm going to pause for a moment now and check in with Joanna and see if any questions have been uh, sent. Yeah, so if anyone wants to add any questions into the chat, um, you can do that. We do have one here. Uh, why is the public school system reluctant to keep to accept offerings from working musicians? Do you have any thoughts on that, Gary? Um, I do. Um, and first of all, what I've experienced, and I have experienced that as well, is that usually it's a function of budget um, as opposed to um, not having the desire for it to happen. Um, but increasingly, and I don't know uh, how recently um, uh, this, this um, person has, has experienced this, but I know currently uh, what I've experienced uh, is there's a real desire and hunger and even outreach uh, from the school system for uh, Minnesota artists to come into uh, the classroom. And, and I'll give you a pointing example of that. Uh, literally just this past week, um, the uh, Bloomington uh, school system, middle school system reached out to me to do a five week uh, master class and lecture demonstration series. And so, uh, and, and the, I, the reason I say that I think it's more open now is it's so um, telling that that just happened now because uh, let me put this perspective on it. I personally uh, have done more workshops and lecture demos overseas in Europe and, and, and Asia, primarily Japan, that I have right here in the Twin Cities. And so I think that there's sometimes reluctance, sometimes hesitation, but I think oh, more than that, I think there's a lack of awareness of that as an option. And so that's why it shouldn't have to be on us as artists, but because of that, that unawareness, uh, it is uh, incumbent upon us to reach out to the school system, to the library system, to the community centers, to the parks, uh, to offer up uh, our music, our expertise, um, lecture demos, um, seminars, music workshops uh, for them. And I think when we do that, that they will be uh, more amenable to that. Thank you. Uh, well, we have a comment here in the chat that says, uh, speaking of steps, my brother tells me that my, Michael and the Mystics and Showtime will never be topped. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whoever said that, you know what? I totally agree. Uh, Michael's Mystics, Showtime Part 1 and 2, and, and, and I'm so glad, you know, in the black church, you know, we say, can I get a witness? And I'm so glad I got a witness uh, that, that knows that I was not exaggerating about Showtime Part 1 and 2, Michael's Mystics, and groups like Philadelphia Story and Midwest Express and beyond. Uh, the family, there were so many that were so excellent. Uh, another question came in that said, uh, what funding resources are available to fund professional performances in the public schools? Um, and if you have any thoughts or recommendations, that's wonderful. I'm so glad they said that because that was something uh, that were in my that was in my notes to touch on um, that in my haste I overlooked. And that is this. 
uh, the Minnesota uh, State Arts Board um, in terms of reaching out for artist grants to do that. Um, that's a big component. Thank you for that question because again, that sparked uh, another piece of my presentation uh, that I, I apologize for overlooking. Submitting, writing and submitting grants, Bush Foundation, uh, Minnesota State Arts Board, uh, the Minneapolis Foundation, the St. Paul Foundation, uh, and others are all uh, amenable and available um, and open to grants from artists to fund uh, your projects, not only within the schools and libraries and, and, and parks and so forth, but even your recordings, um, your performances. And so uh, that's that's a really key component uh, for taking Minnesota music into the future. Wonderful. Uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment, but we have a comment about, uh, it'd be great if there were cultural ministers who could oversee these activities. Uh, I agree, and you know what? Informally, there sort of already are, uh, but but informally may not be uh, enough. Uh, that's something that could be uh, a designated title and function, um, and or, or even a hired or volunteer, whatever function. But that's something that uh, can be formalized because we certainly have them here, uh, or people that let me put it this way that are acting in that capacity anyway. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, my dear friend and brother, uh, we call him St. Paul, Paul Peterson, uh, who I just spoke with the other day, uh, well, the, the entire Peterson family, for that matter. Uh, speaking of families, the Steeles, J.D., Billy, Fred, uh, Javita, Gerilyn, all any of them uh, can really are, are almost in that capacity anyway. Um, Gwen Matthews, I, I know that they, because I, I work with them uh, in different capacities, I know that they coach and mentor uh, different artists and groups um, all the time, uh, really in that same capacity that you're talking about. And so to have it actually designated uh, and even funded would be great as well. But but the, the, the function is, is already uh, in place. Well, and I have a question, if you don't mind. Oh, um, I would love to hear what Sounds of Blackness is up to and, and what's on the horizon for the group. Well, thank you so much. As they say, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, a few things. First of all, um, our next, uh, we've got a few local performances coming up. We're going to do the national anthem for uh, the St. Paul Saints, who are now the farm team for the Twins, for those sports out there, fans out there. And uh, that will be um, on uh, the evening of May 9th, which I believe is a Tuesday. Um, that's a 7 o'clock at night game. But uh, even on a much larger scale and more seriously, uh, we are so honored, Sounds of Blackness is, to have been asked by um, the Floyd family, the family of, of uh, Brother George Floyd, to um, headline uh, a concert at, uh, at, on his anniversary, the anniversary of, of us losing him. That's May 25th. There's going to be basically an all-day um, community commemoration uh, that's going to, there'll be things for, for there for the children. There'll be food, there'll be vendors right at George Floyd Square uh, in our old hood, and still my hood, 38th in, in Chicago, South Minneapolis, right where we lost him. There'll be a stage set up. There'll be rides for the kids. There'll be food. There'll be art vendors. Uh, it'll be something that will last all day. And then in the evening, um, there'll be some spoken word and performances before Sounds of Blackness, and then Sounds of Blackness will come on uh, and, and with a performance. And then we will close out with special guest common. And so uh, we are so excited. Again, that's May 25th, and that's a Tuesday. And uh, I think the only other thing I should say is that we are working on, uh, at, literally as we speak, um, a number of different uh, uh, new recordings, uh, songs with titles like Hold Up Your Light by our own Carrie Harrington. Uh, I know a, a number of you know Jamesia Bennett. Uh, who's you know our, our featured vocalist and and she uh, you know is a solo artist in her own right as well. She has just uh, written and we've just finished recording uh, a great song of hers called "You're Gonna Win," and uh, we're looking to release uh, a Jamisi and Carrie songs later this summer. But before that, yours truly has written a song uh, that we're looking to release for Juneteenth and that you should look for online. And the title is "Time for Reparations." 
Wonderful. Thank you. And we do have a couple more comments. Sure. Um, and uh, I think one of them is a great kind of closing comment on my end. Uh, but the first comment is embracing the digital opportunities that currently exist feels like something that should and could last well beyond COVID times. 100% agree with your comments here. Oh, I'm glad that you do because, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're in a digital world, I mean, that's here to stay. I, and I think uh, the realities of, of COVID um, brought it to a different level in terms of, of necessity and urgent because we couldn't uh, go to orchestra hall. We couldn't go to the Ordway. Uh, we couldn't go to, uh, to first Ave. Uh, you name the venue uh, and, and hopefully soon we will, but that doesn't mean that the music should stop, you know? Uh, and, and I agree uh, with our late great brother uh, Prince. It still seems so unreal that he's gone, but uh, he would say that nothing stops the music. Um, there's a historical, uh, um, great example of that. I have an expression that says you can take the African out of Africa, but you can't take the Africa out of the African. And, and I, that says that despite 300 years of the transatlantic slave trade and, and the music being forbidden by slave masters, uh, the original instruments, the original songs, the music and, and, and heart and soul of African music still never died. And, and hence the birth of R and B and spirituals and blues and work songs and so in that in that way you can't stop the music and and uh this is just yet another poignant example of that and um the digital age is is our friend so embrace it don't resist it uh don't don't fight it uh, i can do a lot for you and and as artists and for all of us and our last comment is uh I think very fitting uh, um, from Julie. Thank you so very much for your words, your energy, your gifts, and for sharing it with us. You have been and continue to be an inspiration. And I would absolutely echo that. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Joanna. On behalf of Sounds of Blackness, you know, um, there's an old spiritual that says, my soul looks back and wonders. And, and you know, uh, we, on behalf of Sounds of Blackness, I want to thank you all. You know, we thank God first and foremost, and we thank you guys for supporting Sounds of Blackness uh, for 50 years. I mean, it, it, it seems unreal even saying that. Um, but, you know, it only happens by the grace of God and by the support of, of wonderful people like you guys. We can make all the music we want, but if you guys, you know, aren't feeling it and don't support like you have, um, then it's all for naught. And uh, we want to invite everybody uh, to our website uh, and all of our online sites. But our website is, is really easy, just soundsofblackness.org.org. And all of our other sites at TikTok and, and Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, are all basically just a group name, Sounds of Blackness. You, you type that in and, and we'll come up. You will hear back from us. Um, you can go there to uh, purchase a copy of our current single, Sick and Tired. And uh, a shameless plug, I'm wearing the Sick and Tired t-shirt that you can see here. <laughs> and a lot of people have asked about that from the video, which you can see on YouTube. And, uh, you know, again, speaking of digital age, I mean, this was all right here out of the Twin Cities, designed and made by, I'm at the home studio right now, uh, of Stephanie Hardigan of uh, Sassafras. You can also get the merchandise at uh, What the Sassafras um, online. And uh, you can get any of our T-shirts and all that. And know that when you do, so this is not just a shameless plug. When you purchase a copy of Sick and Tired or uh, the Sick and Tired t-shirt, please know that uh, Sounds of Blackness are donating a portion of that to the George Floyd Scholarship Fund. Yes, and if you haven't had a chance to watch the Sick and Tired video, it's it's amazing, so. Oh, thank you, and, and you know, but thank you so much for that. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, was directed by our own Jamesia Bennett, who they made her video uh, directorial debut. Good. Well, we don't have any other comments in the comment section. Um, so Gary, it has been such a pleasure to visit with you and to hear all about the history of, of the music that has inspired you and what you see for the future. I'm very, very grateful for the time you spent with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Joanna. It's been a blast. Thank you for all of uh, the preparation, all the endless emails and phone calls. We appreciate you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs>